Good to be with all of you in this digital space. Of course, these recordings are made possible because of John and Mary Phillips, who shepherd the technology so that I look and sound as good as possible for these fireside chats. It really takes the pressure off me, so thank you both. This fall, though, is a big time of pressure for those returning to school. Maybe that's why simple creature comforts are so popular. For those spending ever more time on their devices. I know it's a bad pun. There were, however, earlier analog versions of our current digital platforms. Some of us immerse ourselves in the procedural dramas on television where mysteries seem safer and more distant. Meanwhile, children now returned to the schoolyard try out interesting ways to test and confuse their teachers. Within the home, however, the huge increase in people getting pets during the pandemic has unexpected consequences. While we will soon need to prove we have been double vaccinated to attend orchestral concerts, have you ever wondered what a conductor does? Luckily, there is no need for vaccine passports on Noah's Ark. Well, I'm not old enough to remember Noah's Ark. This statement strikes home for me. Going back to prehistory, definitions were creative. Ah, uh, yes, I am pasteurized. Perhaps some would say that my ordination makes me safe for consumption, like pasteurized milk. Others wonder if it means I've been put out to pasture where I can do little harm. Still others perceive me as the one to solve everyone's problems and lead them to happiness. However, happiness is not what we may think. Happiness is not getting everything we want or controlling things around us. Instead, I would define happiness as that moment when we stop constantly craving for more, shifting to an embrace of change without fearing the very change, which is a constant part of life. From a faith perspective, the challenge Jesus calls us to enact is for justice and for right relation. As biblical scholar Don, John Dominic Crossan tells us, in the Hebrew Bible, God says, I reject your worship because of your lack of justice. God never says, I reject your justice because of your lack of worship. In a similar manner, Martin Luther King Jr. observed during his work for civil rights, the richer we have become materially, the poorer we become morally and spiritually. We have learned to fly in the air like birds and swim in the sea like fish, but we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers, as siblings. Now, that statement may seem harsh, but I believe it was an insightful critique of the world he saw unfolding around him as he was following a similar path to the one Jesus walked. Jesus wasn't nice. Oh, yes, he was loving and inclusive, but he was loving and inclusive in the way that gets you rejected by the religious. Yes, he was generous and faithful and helpful and truthful, but in the way that gets you persecuted by the powerful, even crucified. Now it is our time to speak up. After all, oppression can only survive through silence. Our working to turn back the tides of oppressive injustice often comes as much in the personal level as at the regional, provincial, or national level. 
what if we incorporated this approach into our justice making for right relations? May we raise children who love the unloved things, the dandelion, the worms, and the spiderlings. Children who sense the rose needs the thorn and run into rain-swept days the same way they run toward the sun. And when they're grown and someone has to speak for those who have no voice, may they draw upon that wider bond, those days of tending tender things, and be the ones who speak for the voiceless and harrowed. Consider this story, whether it is actually fictional or true, because I would consider it a form of parable which follows from how we raise our children and grandchildren so they understand the power of relationships rooted in love and live through right relation. A man was at a grocery store buying some early potatoes. He noticed a small boy, delicate of bone and feature, ragged but clean, hungrily appraising a basket of freshly picked green peas. The man paid for his potatoes, but he was also drawn to the display of fresh green peas being a pushover for cream peas and new potatoes. Pondering the peas, the man couldn't help but overhear the conversation between Mr. Miller, who was the store owner, and the ragged boy next to him. Hello, Barry, how are you today? Hello, Mr. Miller. Fine, thank you. Just admiring them peas. They sure look good. They are good, Barry. How's your mom? Fine, getting stronger all the time. Good. Anything I can help you with? No, sir, just admiring them peas. Would you like to take some home, asked Mr. Miller. No, sir, got nothing to pay for them with. Well, what have you to trade me for those peas? All I got my prize marble here. Is that right? Let me see it, said Miller. Here it is, she's dandy. I can see that. Hmm. The only thing is, this one is blue, and I sort of go for red. Do you have a red one like this at home, the store owner asked? Not exactly, but almost. Tell you what, take this sack of peas home with you, and next trip this way, let me look at that red marble, Mr. Miller told the boy. Sure will. Thanks, Mr. Miller. Mrs. Miller, who had been standing nearby, came over to help the man. With a smile, she said, there are two other boys like him in our community. All three are in very poor circumstances. Jim just loves to bargain with them for peas, apples, tomatoes, or whatever. When they come back with their red marbles, and they always do, he decides he doesn't like red after all and sends them home with a bag of produce for green marble or an orange one when they come on their next trip to the store. The man left the store smiling, impressed with this young, this man who owned the store. A short time later, the man moved to Colorado, but never forgot the story of this store owner, the boys, and their bartering for marbles. Several years went by, each more rapid than the previous one. The man had occasion to visit some friends in that Idaho community, and while the man was there, learned that Mr. Miller had died. The community was having a visitation for Mr. Miller that evening. Since the man's friends wanted to go, the man agreed to accompany them. Upon arrival at the mortuary, they fell into line to meet the relatives of the deceased and to offer whatever words of comfort they could. Ahead of them in the line were three young men. All of them were very professional looking. They approached Mrs. Miller, standing composed and smiling by her husband's casket. Each of the young men hugged her, kissed her on the cheek, spoke briefly with her and moved on to the casket. Her misty light blue eyes followed them as one by one, each young man stopped briefly placed his own warm hand over the cold, pale hand in the casket. Each left the mortuary awkwardly, wiping his eyes. Eventually, it was time for the man and his friends to meet Mrs. Miller. The man told her who he was and reminded her of the story of those many years ago and what 
She had told him about her husband's bartering for marbles. With her eyes glistening, she took the man's hand and led him to the casket. Those three young men who just left were the boys I told you about. They just told me how they appreciated the things Jim traded them. Now at last, when Jim could not change his mind about color or size, they came to pay their debt. We've never had a great deal of wealth in this world, she confided, but right now, Jim would consider himself the richest man in Idaho. With loving gentleness, she lifted the lifeless fingers of her deceased husband. Resting underneath were three exquisitely shined red marbles. These are the kinds of relationships that we can foster in our lives, one person at a time. Such relationships transform each of us for right relation, which helps to create justice. Sometimes those relationships are ones that touch people we don't even know, just as this video demonstrates. I'm gonna to try to do this without crying. Um, so my dad passed away uh, March of this year, 2021 from cancer. Uh, he had mantle cell lymphoma and Princess Bride was always one of his favorite movies and it's always been one of my own my favorite movies and Inigo Montoya was his favorite character from the film uh, played by the wonderful Mandy Patinkin and I recently learned or heard you know a rumor online that in the scene with Count Rugen the six-fingered man when you know it's their famous duel and he says, you know, I'll give you anything you want. And he says, I want my father back, you son of a bitch. I saw on the internet the rumor that when Mandy Patinkin said that line, he was thinking of his own father who had passed away from cancer. And it was a very raw emotion and I ever since then it's kind of really stuck with me um so I guess I just kind of wanted to know if that is or if that's a true thing if that's a real thing I know that Mandy Patinkin has a, tic a TikTok but I don't think that it'll ever go that far but I was just really curious um because it means so much more to me now than it ever did um and if this ever does reach Mandy Patinkin, just thank you so much for your performance in that movie because it meant so much to me and my dad. So thank you. Like, that was it. Anyway, <gasps> just missing my dad. Anyway, okay, that's it. Thousands of people tagged you so that you'd maybe get to see it, yeah. even though she has a couple. But that just killed me. <laughs> that killed me too. So Alaska. Yeah. First of all, first yeah. your dad is taking care of you. Secondly, it is true, 100% true. I went outside in this castle and walked around, okay. and I kept talking to my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm going to get this guy. From the minute I read the script, I, I knew I said to Kev, I said, I'm going to do this part because in my mind, if I get this six-fingered guy, that means I kill the cancer that killed my dad, and I'll get to visit my dad. And that moment was coming. I went and I played that scene with, with uh, Chris, and... Uh, and then I went back out there and talked to my dad. And so you can talk to your dad anytime you want, anywhere you want. If you could somehow let me know your dad's name, because I say prayers for everyone I've ever known. And now I feel like I know you, and therefore I know your dad. And I will list his name in my prayers every day. Uh, and they make me feel like they're with me wherever I go. And I'd like your dad to hang out with me. I'm gonna try to do this without crying. <clears throat> Like the deep and abiding connection made between Mandy Patenkin and the woman asking the question on TikTok, so many of us carry a weight inside we are afraid to reveal to others. Instead, we put on a mask that hides what lies within. That too is a form of oppression, but oppression which we force on ourselves. I experience this in my ministry all the time. I ask, how are you today? 
And the response is, good, you? Then I ask, good, what brings you to talk to me today? And the enlightening response is, I'm not doing so good. I'm glad that people find me a trustworthy person in whom to confide, knowing that everything is confidential. So many people carry a burden of past trauma to which is added bad news on TV or radio, to which are added the pressures of the pandemic, to which is added further the stresses of daily living. Then when people encounter a minor inconvenience, they fall apart. To the outsider, it would seem like they are overreacting. Instead, it is an opportunity to remove their self-imposed impression by giving them our time and our attention. By doing so, we can share this. That's the overreacting, but we can share this part that might be a way of telling one another that we are worthy. It is equally true that you are resilient and you also need a break, that you gave your all and you now need to back out. If we could go to the next slide. That you are independent and you still need others. That you are sure and that things have changed, making you less sure that you are kind. And to remain so requires healthy boundaries. That others have it worse and your pain is just as valid. That you did your best and you now know more, having learned through the process. Through such learning about how to incorporate balance in your life, some stranger somewhere still remembers you because you were kind to them when no one else was. In the same way as grocery store owner, Mr. Miller, who bargained for the marbles. Now that September is fully here, in light of how the pandemic has uncovered the many gaps in our social systems which marginalize too many. We hear Jesus call more powerfully for justice and for right relation. Some of us will work on our relationships at a personal level, providing that compassionate, listening, healing ear. Others will work on systems of injustice in our community and in our world. Still others will do a bit of each. It is together, thankfully, that we make a difference, combining our strengths to create change that is rooted in love. I pray that it may be so in your life and throughout all our lives. As I look around at the beauty of creation all around us, I am inspired by the interconnection and the interdependence of life a reflection of the dynamic image of God in us all. Such is the reality of right relation from my perception. With that in mind, let us pray. Loving God, who created us for one another, like tree branches reaching up to life-giving light, we yearn to be bathed in the light of Christ, that we might nurture mutual relationships of compassionate caring. Like the strong trunk which supports those reaching branches, we depend upon your spirit's strength to convey life to each part of us. Like concealed tree roots pushing deeply into the rich earth to both anchor and to nourish, we nestle deeply into your grace to anchor us in faith and to nourish us with a passion for justice and for right relation. Thank you for your constant and consistent presence in our lives, God alive. Through your assurance, we know that all will be well. Amen. In the same way I have talked about our interdependence, I am so grateful for Terry Boyd and David Skinner who upload these fireside chat recordings to our YouTube channel. There is no way I could make these digital connections to those of you watching this fireside chat without either of them. I want to leave you with a blessing which is modeled on the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. On this first day back to school for our children and for our grandchildren, when there is much uncertainty around the fourth wave due to the Delta variant of COVID-19, 
this strikes home. Blessed are you who are weary and burdened, for you, you whose heart aches with the news of the day. May ease find its way into your being, softening your heat as you rest in God's promise of love. Blessed are you with chaotic minds, you who carry schedules and to-do lists. May grace whisper softly with a gentle reminder, you are enough. You are enough. You are enough. Blessed are you with tension in your neck, who are worried, tired, or stressed. May the breath of the Spirit fill your lungs, stilling your thoughts, softening your brow, unclenching your jaw. Blessed are you with a weary heart, you who carry the weight of the world. May the peace that passes all understanding work its way into every crevice of your being and fill you with love. Amen. I pray that this blessing becomes your experience this week. I will be on holiday next week, so I will see you again on Tuesday, September 21st. Until that next fireside chat. Goodbye.